Pet Life Radio. This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Is your pet stressed out? Does your pet need annual vaccines? Which pet is best for a child? Would you know if your dog was in pain? Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor, where you'll learn everything about keeping your pet healthy and happy. From pet care, pet meds and grooming, to pet food, pet insurance and dental care, this is the place to find out everything there is to know about pet wellness. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets because it's your pet. Health matters. Please welcome your pet doctor host, veterinarian media consultant and veterinarian, Dr. Bernadine Cruz. GI issues are one of the most common reasons why pets are presented to veterinarians. Dogs love to eat first and think later. One of the reasons why our canine companions are prone to the heartbreak of diarrhea. Cats, however, are more apt to becoming constipated. Occasional slowdown of our bowels happens to all of us. But chronic constipation can be life-threatening. How do you know your cat's constipated? What can you do to prevent it? How do you treat the cats that's full of it? My guest is Dr. Anthony Carr, board certified in small animal internal medicine and professor of small animal clinical sciences at Western College of Veterinary Medicine, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. We'll be right back after this short break. So if you need to go potty, go now. We'll be right back. Moose is the German Shepherd and hasn't had any kind of health problems at all. He has been on Dynavite since he's a puppy. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. We tell anybody that has a dog, if there was something that you could do right from the beginning so that you don't have expensive veterinary bills, why would you not do it? Get the Dynavite. Dynavite for life. You get some Dynavite, how happy your dog will be. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Dr. Anthony, thank you so much. This is a topic that a lot of people maybe not thinking is the most tasty, but is definitely an important one. I agree. Certainly we see enough cats that come in where that's uh, uh, either an independent problem or it's just part of a, a you know, multiple issues the animal may have that are contributing to the animal not having as good a life as it could. So number one, oftentimes clients will ask me, how often should a cat poop? Well, under most circumstances, ideally you'd like to see at least one defecation per day. And of course, it's it's also a little bit not so much even the frequency as it is the consistency. Cats obviously have harder poops than dogs do, but if it comes out like a brick, it's that even if the cat's defecating every day, that's probably not ideal. It has to be a slightly deformable, but again, ideally, certainly every day, every other day is starting to push the envelope. Okay. So it's one of the things that I now like about veterinary medicine is that we have a fecal scoring chart. So instead of, you know, sometimes people will send me pictures on, you know, their text and it's like, oh, all right, you know, I can see what that looks like. But I used to do it with food and I don't think that was probably one of the most uh, palatable things. So is it soft serve ice cream? Was it a Tootsie Roll that's been out in the sun too long? So it shouldn't be hard bunny pellets and it shouldn't be blowout liquid, kind of more like a squishy Tootsie Roll, correct? Yeah, that would be right. Something that can deform a little bit, but should be nicely formed and stay in shape when it's passed. I think it's one of the reasons I've never liked those automated cat boxes because it just scoops it away. It's like, how do you know what's going on? So I think all of us are scatologists at heart. You know, if you own a pet, you know what their poop looks like. And you know when something's wrong. So how do you know when a cat is constipated? Just because it's not going every day or every other day? That'd certainly be one of the ways. And again, in, in, in general, what you're going to see initially is that, you know, if you're not keeping track of it, you're just not going to notice the fact that the cat's maybe not defecating every day. Maybe now it's every other day, every third day, and then it may just stop for a while. And, and that can certainly be difficult to monitor in a multi-cat household. If there's only one or two cats, it's probably easier to keep track of. Uh, but then once that goes for a period of time, then you're going to start seeing negative health consequences to the cat. The cat's going to become um, progressively more uncomfortable. Uh, it may try to defecate without luck. So it may also try to strain in the litter box. There may even be some small amounts of liquid feces that are passed, which is when it gets really bad, 
and they're really, really bunged up, you get this, this rock inside of the rectum, and that causes irritation, which then causes the colon to do what it's supposed to, which is to form some mucus and a little bit of liquid to try to protect itself. So sometimes we even get these cats presented to us with a history of having diarrhea, but all it is is the cat trying to adapt to having this piece of concrete in its rectum. And I've seen that many times come in where they say, oh, yeah, it's having diarrhea, and you feel their tummies. It's like, nope, it's just the opposite. Yeah. And I said they can become life-threatening ill if that's allowed to go for a very long period of time. So Dr. Carr, what causes constipation? And I'd love to have you tell me if I read information someplace that was just totally erroneous. I once read and believe that I heard that cats have the longest colon of all domesticated species. So the fecal material has a chance to sit in that colon for a longer period of time, having the moisture removed turning into that harder stool. Is that right or wrong? I don't think that's quite right. Actually, colons, if you think about some of our other species, they're way longer than they what they are in the cats. Now, I think part of what you said is correct in that the problem cats have as a sort of semi-desert dweller and an animal that doesn't like to drink is that they are many, many, many times borderline dehydrated. And when the colon does its job, its job is to remove as much water out of the feces as possible. So if you're dehydrated, it's going to suck every piece of moisture out of that feces as possible and make a really, really hard fecal ball. Whereas if you're hydrated, then that need isn't there. So I think that is part of it. It's the cat more so that it always tends to go towards dehydration. And then most of the ones that we see, the really bad ones, we really don't even know what the underlying reason is. What we often see is kind of the end stage. They've had it so long that they get what's called megacolon and just the colon is stretched beyond its ability to do anything anymore. So cats normally groom so much more than dogs. I've seen cats that, I'm sure you have too, that are stressed, over grooming, they will lick themselves almost bald in areas. Does that fur make a major difference in their history of getting constipated? I mean, I think it can in some instances, certainly because essentially what you're looking at is fiber, like it's an undigestible product that winds up bulking up the stool, which on the one hand can be good because bulking up the stool can be beneficial. But we know that in cats with, for instance, chronic constipation, high fiber diets actually are not very good. We actually want some that have really digestible fiber. So I think, you know, in some cats, that extra hair just adds to the bulk that cats don't like to deal with. And age-wise, is this typically, seems like most of the pets that come through my door who are having these severe chronic constipation issues, usually are middle to older age cats. Do their GI tracts change just as people's do? Yeah, and I agree with you. I think that's mainly what I see too, is the middle to older age pets. I think actually in that situation, what it is, is that as they get middle age to older, you wind up having all these other problems like chronic kidney disease, hyperthyroidism. And in general, cats, I mean, older people as well, just tend to drink less as they age. And so I think a big part of the contribution is that Again, the things that cause dehydration are more likely at an older age. And then you know, the rest of it, we really don't know why it occurs. Most of it seems to be just kind of a chronic overstretching of the colon that causes problems. You keep talking about hydration for cats and that, yes, it is difficult to get them to drink water. So canned food, dry food, of course, canned food is going to have more liquid in it, kind of like their prey having more moisture for them. What are some other ways of getting more moisture into your cat? Well, I mean, there's a, there are a bunch of tricks that are out there, you know, whether the cat happens to enjoy um, a tap running, a fountain, um, adding flavor to some cats. Uh, there is a product out there now, the Purina HydroCare, which is meant to increase the total hydration status. And that seems to have some really promising effects and the cats, many cats seem to like it. So, I mean, those are all things you can do, certainly. Um, I recommend it that, again, these are chronic things, so it's good to start off as early as possible. So you kind of want to get a cat used to both canned and dry food, because I do think the ones that are mainly on dry food are more likely to have a problem. Putting water in the dry food may help, but then if cats have been used to only dry kibble, they may not want to eat the stuff that's moistened. So I can get them cats used early on in their life to canned and dry so that you can switch over to a diet that has more water in it. That's probably the most effective way to do it. 
and just keep watching their poop. I think it's one of the most important things. Know what changes are going on. Get your pets in there at least once a year for a good wellness checkup. They'll be asking all sorts of questions. And one of them, yes, is going to be poop and bring in poop. You mentioned there's other underlying problems that can cause a cat to have sometimes even worsening constipation because it doesn't seem like there's an exact cause for constipation in cats. You'd mentioned hyperthyroidism. What are some of the other ones? And uh, kidney disease seems like typically cats with kidney disease are drinking more water. So why are they getting constipated? So although kidney cats may be drinking more water, they're still usually not able to keep up with hydration because most of the time when we do physical exams on these cats, we can sense that they're dehydrated just on the on the basis of their skin temp. So even though they are drinking a lot, it's usually still not necessarily enough for them to keep up with their hydration. Diabetes is another one that can wind up. I guess they drink a lot, but often they won't keep up with it. Then there are some things that have been kind of, that are out there, but they're just rare instances. So uh, certainly neurologic dysfunction, Manx cats, for instance, anything where the tail has been uh, either bred off or has been traumatized, they can have some problems with defecating, which then may allow the feces just to sit in there too long. Strictures, that's, that's a really rare cause, but we do see it on occasion. Maybe osteoarthritis as well. So in older cats, if they get really painful in their knees and hips, they may have a difficult time posturing. They may try to avoid doing that. And as I said, it's kind of that chronicity, just continuous, less defecation means more stretching in the colon, means less ability of the colon to empty itself, means more stretching in the colon. And so I, I think it's really important that we pick up on this as early as possible because preventive measures are way better than trying to fix a problem once it's there. One of the things I seem to recognize when these cats are coming in that are constipated and oftentimes repeatedly. Number one thing I always do is I've learned is to look at their little bums because especially if they're longer hair cats and somebody says, oh yeah, doc, my cat's constipated, keeps going to the box, nothing's coming out, going, hmm, long hair cat, you kind of stink, sweetheart. And just lift up the tail going, oh, well, the reason why your cat is not going. It's not because it doesn't want to. It can't because of this wad of feces and crusted fur that's literally acting like a plug for their little derriere. So once you get that trimmed away, it's like, ah, oh, thank you. I can poop again. But then also obese cats. Obese cats seem to be more prone to getting constipated. Yeah, and that's certainly an issue. And again, it can, could very well be in partially that they're less mobile, so they're moving around less, which means there's less kind of a stimulus for the colon to contract. They often also have mobility issues in general, such as posturing, that they have less desire to defecate. And all that contributes to constipation, both in humans and in cats. All right. So now we have a constipated kitty. You had mentioned something called megacolon. And megacolon sounds like meg, huge. And that's what it is. Explain how they get this megacolon and what can be the consequences of this. So with megacolon, it's kind of, we're approaching an end stage in constipation. So obstipation, constipation is constipated every now and then don't defecate. Obstipation is kind of a longer term where the animal hasn't defecated. And then there's megacolon. And what we see there is in the colon, and, and there are specific criteria for it, but basically the colon's maybe twice its normal size. And it's going to be filled almost completely with very dry, firm feces. At that point, that colon has very little mobility. And usually the material that's in there is so big that it can't pass without help from the veterinarian or the owner in order to try to get that stuff moved out of there. That doesn't mean it's quite end stage. There's still many effective treatments. And I think as we've gotten better at treating this, we have fewer of the cases that do go on to be end stage where we actually have to remove most of the colon in order to save these cats. Just sounds horrible. So I'm speaking right now to Dr. Anthony Carr. We're going to be right back after this short break. So if you need to relieve yourself because you've been hearing so much about colons, feel free to do so, but we'll be right back. Please have a seat in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you shortly, right after these messages. For those fortunate to have experienced the deep bond and unconditional love of a companion animal, the death that follows can be one of the most difficult and misunderstood losses to go through. Many times, this devastating loss goes unrecognized and trivialized by family and friends, leaving grieving pet parents struggling to find healthy ways to cope with the loss. 
In And I Love You Still, a thoughtful guide and remembrance journal for healing the loss of a pet, Dr. Julianne Corbin calls attention to the difficulties unique to the loss of a beloved pet and provides an interactive and compassionate guide to help you process your loss and work towards coming to a place of peace and healing. For those interested in journal therapy and looking for a professionally written and compassionate resource to help understand and reconcile the grief associated with the loss of your pet, this book is for you. And I Love You Still, a thoughtful guide and remembrance journal by Julianne Corbin is now available for purchase on Amazon and other major book retailers. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLiferadio.com. Welcome back to the Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio. The doctor is in and we'll see you now. Dr. Carr, you had mentioned megacolon that sometimes surgery is necessary. Thankfully, it seems to be uncommon that it gets to that point if you can get on top of this early. So you have a cat that has constipation, occasional constipation. What can you do for that cat? You mentioned before something like more fiber. And I think that's what people get confused. There's, if you're constipated, you need more fiber. And if you have diarrhea, you need more fiber. So explain, please. Yeah, it does seem that sometimes fiber seems like a silver bullet because no matter what the problem is, it knows what it's supposed to do. But with, uh, with, Constipation, that's definitely a major factor in it. And there are different kinds of fiber. So there's non-digestible fiber and digestible fiber. And really what we want is the digestible fiber. We used to recommend diets that were high in undigestible fiber with the thought that that would help something, you know, that would be similar to psyllium, for instance. And we found that that actually doesn't work very well for cats. But they also don't do very well with diets that don't have fiber. And what they really want is a diet that has really well digestible fiber in it. There have been studies that have shown that some diets are highly effective at preventing repeat constipation issues. So for instance, the uh, Royal Canin GI fiber response in cats, there is a paper out there that showed it was able to, in many, many cases, resolve uh, constipation issues in cats. So that's certainly one of the first things is that diet should be adjusted. If they are dehydrated, try to fix as much as either the underlying reason, if it's diabetes, treat diabetes. Uh, with the other ones, it's maybe just trying to do as much as you can to get as much fluid into the cat as possible, whether that's through supplements, water fountains, sub Q fluids, whatever you need to do to keep the animal hydrated. And then the next step would be usually as we ramp that up, if that's not working, the next step then is laxatives. And if that doesn't work, then the next step would be some kind of drug that helps the colon to work better. Mentioning laxatives, people will try laxatone, petromol, just some brand names of some various hairball medicines. Do they work? Is How do you need to give that? Because I know oftentimes cats might kind of lap it up a little bit, but they give a finger full. If it's going to work, how much does it work, number one, and how much do they need to give? So with a lot of the those products, they're actually more for hairballs. And so I don't usually recommend those kind of products for a constipated cat that's having repeat episodes. The two that are most commonly used are lactulose, which is uh, undigestible, at least for, for the small intestine, undigestible milk, a product that winds up then going to the colon where the bacteria digested and that leads to fluid coming in. So lactulose is a, is a fairly effective laxative, uh, both in humans and, and in cats and in dogs. Downside we know from people is that it winds up causing a little bit of cramping and un desirable gas production. Hmm. Um, so the one I've actually went to, um, and we've done some research on that, is is uh, the polyethylene glycol 3350, which is uh, Miralax, Laxidae. There's a bunch of products. If you go to any pharmacy and just look on the shelf for the products for constipation, you're going to find generic and brand name products that, that include 3350. Those are also the things that are used for people before colonoscopy. So those have the advantage that they're very effective and don't cause any water to be secreted into the intestine and don't cause any irritation to the intestine. So they're used quite commonly in people. They also don't cause the gassy effect. So they don't tend to cause as much cramping and gas effect as the lactulose does. The other advantage is that the polyethylene glycol powder is fairly acceptable to cats, whereas lactulose 
as a liquid, cats don't like it because it's sweet and they're not really in tune to sweet that much. And there is a dry powder, but it's kind of the same problem that sometimes you'll get cats not want to consume it. Whereas with the pig powder over the food, they tend not to have a problem with accepting that. Very good to know. A product that I've heard being used are the little capsules of DSS, little red gelatin capsules. I can't even remember exactly what the DSS stands for. I'm sure you do. How does that work or does it work? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things that work. And so the DSS works too. It's a little bit more of an irritative thing. So it causes a little bit of irritation to the gut and that causes them fluid secretion. So, I mean, I've, I've used a lot of different products and have pretty well settled now I'm almost exclusively using a PEG 3350 just because of the efficacy, the ease of administration, and most mainly the efficacy. Like it's really, if you give enough PEG, you will get a cat to move its bowels. And if you give a little bit too much, you'll have a cat with diarrhea. So it, it is really, really effective. Good to know. Oftentimes clients are coming in and they've been trying to work on this. Yeah, they realize the cat's poop's getting a little on the hard side. So I know I'm just going to add some mineral oil to the diet, or I'm going to put vegetable oil, or even giving something like milk of magnesia. Yeah, and I think all of those really, I mean, they're either not going to be efficacious, even with milk and magnesia, they're not really ideal for a cat. So I, I think it's best to to stick with products that that have proven efficacy and, and a good safety profile. And so for, we did studies at, at our university where we did look at the use of PEG 3350 for cats. They were given it for four weeks. We were able to kind of titrate that to get the stool that we wanted. And we had absolutely no changes in blood work or any, uh, they ate the same amount of calories. Um, they had no adverse side effects. So I said, I kind of think that it's important to stick with, with a product that actually has some proven efficacy. It's the same problem in humans. There are tons and tons of laxatives on the shelf. I mean, if you go into a pharmacy, you're looking at a couple of feet of shelf space that are just variety of laxatives. And if you look at them, the majority of them have no proven efficacy. Or if they have efficacy, it's quite minimal. Even like all the psyllium fiber, as far as a laxative, they're not that terribly effective. They may work if you have slight irregularity, but they're not going to work if you have a real problem. And so I, I think I said, if you're gonna have a, if you have a problem, you should probably deal with it with medications that have proven efficacy. With the cat that's now constipated and it's gotten to the point of being ostipated, you've tried veterinarian, you have tried fluids under the skin, subcutaneous fluids, you've tried your peg powders, Miralax, that's not doing it. You've tried various things, now it's left. What do you have to do? Because when I tell people about this, they're horrified. Right. So, I mean, in, in many cases, what we used to do is manual disimpaction, which sounds a lot more fun than what it actually is, both for the cat and for the veterinarian doing it. So actually trying to scoop that material out of there. And a lot of times we'll do a couple of enemas to try to soften it up. And sometimes the enemas give us a little bit of benefit, but in a really obstipated cat, that's going to take a long time to work. So what we actually went to as well, and we have done this for, uh, we kind of developed that idea and it's used in people as well. So people who are obstipated and constipated, to be honest, they do occasionally manually disimpact those people as well, which is kind of a gross thought, but it does happen. Yep. But what they do in general, and, and it is a big problem, like in um, elder care, hospice care, the people are on opioids, which stops GI motility. They're in bed, so they don't move their colon. They can sometimes not defecate for 20 to 30 days. Oof. And what they do in that case is to use PEG 3350. And that's what we do, actually. We pass um, nasoesophageal feeding tube. So we pass a tube from the nose into the esophagus and we start trickling in the PEG uh, liquid. So we dilute it with water. And we've had success in, I think I've had one failure in the last eight, nine years that we've been doing that. And it's a, for a cat, it's a, I think it's more enjoyable than having multiple enemas and manual disinfection. So that is the, that's the method that we went with. And I know that, you know, just a general, Chatter out there is that a lot of people have, have started using our technique as well and are really happy with it. Because I don't think anybody, none of us vets wanted to ever manually disembark the cat. When I see that pet come in, it's like, oh, here we go again. And I feel so sorry for them, definitely needing to give them pain medication, putting them under anesthesia to do this. And yes, these poor little babies, they are just having a horrid time and it's not inexpensive for the client. You had mentioned, Dr. Carr, using enemas. And yes, we have 
certain types of enemas that we give pets in the hospital setting. Most clients, I don't think, are interested in trying to do this at home. But one of the things we'll always have to tell clients is be really cautious. If you decide you want to try this at home, you go to the pharmacy and you're looking, for instance, a particular brand, Fleet Enemas. Why is something like a Fleet Enema could be death-inducing for a cat? Yeah, so the products in there can actually cause toxicity. There are some small like Microlax products that may be okay, but to be honest, they're meant to draw water into the system. And most of these cats, when they're at this stage, are dehydrated already. So you can't really draw more fluid into them. So our, most of the time, the laxatives we do or the enemas we do in practice are large volume. We're trying to get as much fluid into that colon as possible to help so soften up that stool. So I think these other ones, these tend to be small volume uh, bowel prep type products. They're really ideally suited to somebody who doesn't have a problem, to somebody who isn't really constipated. Once they're really constipated, these products really are not a good idea. You had mentioned that if medical therapy fails, there's surgery. And I think we've all heard of people having to have major colonic surgery and then ending up with a bag afterwards. Now, cats don't end up with bags. So what happens to them? Yeah, so what the surgery is, it's called a subtotal colectomy. So a big part of the colon is removed and the basically the rectum is sort of left behind. And that's connected to the small intestine. So that it's still the same opening, so it's still using the rectum and anus to get the feces out, but most of the colon has been removed. Um, that is a fairly major surgery. Uh, I know our surgeons at the university don't ever look forward to doing the surgery, so it's not anything anybody wants to do, but in, in the kind of the end stage cases, that is a possibility. They will initially have diarrhea from that, so they for the first three to four weeks, they generally have pretty bad diarrhea, but the body adapts to it and they can have fairly decent feces, you know, about a month after the surgery, they're usually fecally continent again and, and it works out okay. Although I'll tell you that even that is not necessarily a be all and end all. I actually had to do my uh, PEG 3350 disimpaction procedure with the nasogastric tube and all that um, in a cat that had had subtotal colectomy. So it was able to then form another, it constipated again. So again, it, it is a rescue operation. It's not inexpensive. There are a certain number of cats that aren't going to survive the surgery. So we really, if at all possible, want to avoid getting to that stage. Very definitely. We know that the surgery can have adverse side effects. You mentioned also that ostipation can possibly be fatal. Okay, so you have this colon full of rock hard poop. You're getting some stool, it seems, around it because you're getting this liquid diarrhea as such. Why is it fatal? Well, it's just that that constant um, stretching of the colon. They stop eating. They stop drinking. It stretches the intestine, so they wind up to start vomiting. Often they'll have vomiting as part of their uh, sign, and most of them, and eventually, uh, they just get a bacterial infection. They go septic and die from that. And we've all been constipated somewhere along the line. We know how uncomfortable it is. So you can imagine your poor cat with this colon full of rock hard stool, how uncomfortable they have to be. Dr. Carr, this hasn't been a fun interview, but it's, I think, a very necessary one because it is such a common problem. How common is constipation, ostipation in cats? Well, I can tell you that um, we have in Saskatoon, where I am, we have about 300, 350,000 people. We have just about the only place, the university is about the only place that does emerge after hours. We wrote up the cases that we saw for constipation over a three year period, and we had to do the PEG 3350 and 60 cats. So we're seeing six, 20 cats roughly a year that have to be hospitalized to deal with their obstipation and constipation. And then there's a ton more that we deal with kind of on an outpatient basis. So it is a very, very common issue, unfortunately. So Dr. Carr, what are your parting words of wisdom to keep your pets, or keep your cats from getting constipated and hopefully never getting ostipated? So certainly uh, preventive care is, is, again, a really, really important thing here. Pay attention to how often your cat's defecating. If that starts to become 
less frequent than it should be, then again, we have a bunch of interventions from making sure fluid balance is good, dietary management, laxatives, agents that make the colon work better, all these things that actually can make a huge difference and prevent that surgery and prevent the hospitalization and potential problems with uh, with the uh, manual disimpaction or any of the other procedures. So again, take care of it early, and then it won't progress to the end stage. Great information. Thank you so much. So I've been speaking with Dr. Anthony Carr. He is board certified in small animal internal medicine and professor of small animal clinical sciences at Western College Veterinary Medicine, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. Dr. Carr, thank you. I really appreciate you talking about a subject that is all too common. Thank you. I was glad to have this chance to talk about this subject. This is Dr. Bernadine Cruz. You've been listening to The Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio. Please tune in again next week. We'll give you more information on how to make you that best possible pet owner. Take care. Pets can be a wonderful addition to your life because they're a member of the family. Keeping them healthy and happy is important. Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor with veterinary media consultant and veterinarian Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile, or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets. The Pet Doctor, on demand every week, only on PetLifeRadio.com.